Good afternoon and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and today my guest is Thea Alvin. Thea, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. I'm so excited to have you. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Thea is a stone sculptor, stonemason, artist in stone, maker of stone experiences, a stone wizard whose work defies gravity. Have I missed anything? No, uh, that covers the stony part. That's the stony part. Well, there's a lot about you that my viewers are going to want to learn about. Now, you've been written up in the New York Times, highlighted by Oprah, and covered over the years by multiple news outlets for your extraordinary stone art and creations. See, are you aware of how remarkable you and your work are? It, it's hard for me to... To answer that, um, yes, I understand that there's celebrity attached to it, but in my everyday life, I'm just me, just doing the things that I do at, on my farm, in my home, with my family. Um, it, it feels really extraordinary to have been so lucky and to have so many opportunities. So I'm, I'm very grateful always for those things. But as far as feeling extraordinary, not really. I just, I feel like me, just, I feel I regular. If that's the thing. Well, you are, you are, you are regular and you're humble and you have a great deal of humility. I understand that you are an extrovert, that you love being around people. I do. But, and I, and I understand your humility, but you, the work that you do is, is, uh, it's genius. And so many people uh, who follow you and your work um, just are in awe of you and the work that you do. So I wanted to share that with you because I get very emotional when I see your work. And you and I are, I'm on social media with you and I've read all your stuff, but I just want you to know that I am very moved by what you do. My husband, I built a stone house and we, and my husband has done stone masonry and um, it's what you're doing is beyond anything that anybody can imagine. So we will move on because I know you're probably blushing and um, this isn't what you want to talk about is, but I want, but I want to ask you, tell us a little bit about, about your life growing up. And, um, and I'd also like to know what inspired you to work in stone. Well, as a child, I was uh, born on, um, in Cape Cod, and I grew up in Martha's Vineyard with my father. But um, when I was little, I lived with my mom for the first 10 years of my life. And we lived sort of on a hippie commune for a bit and then um, near to her parents. And I had a, a lifestyle on the beach in the early 70s where everything was loosey-goosey and free love and all the, all the beautiful hippie things. And then I went to live with my father who was quite religious and very strict. And then I ran away from that experience when I was 18 and moved to Vermont to a hunting camp in Wolcott that my husband and I converted into sort of a house. It was challenging at best. And I had three little kids right off the bat they were little when they started and they're much bigger now. Um, but then um, when I divorced, when I was 28, I came back to stone masonry, which had been my father's profession. And I had, I had done masonry throughout my marriage and throughout the, the rearing of my kids as a, a thing that I would do in my yard and for my friends and sort of around. But as a professional, when I was 28, I started you know, working for masons in the Stowe area. And I learned that um, working for an hourly wage was not going to support my kids. So I began to work um, to develop my skill and to come back to being an artist, which was what my mom's legacy had been. My mother and her father were both artists. And so to use stone as a medium and to, um, to find a way to make stone into art was the mission that I took on. And um, at the time I was working in Stowe at Stowe Craft Gallery, which is now called Remarkable Things. Mm -hmm. And my friend Kirsten Reese, uh, who is now Kirsten Reese Keynes, um, is a fabulous metal artist. And she was then. And she entered me into the SEBA um, show, which is the South End Burlington Business and Arts Association. And I, I, she said, you're going to go in and you're going to do this. And I said, what am I going to do? And she said, you will figure it out. And so I, um, I learned how to build an arch in order to enter a, a piece of sculpture in that show. <clears throat> and 
the the first thing was I was um, fairly poor. I was a single mom of three young children, and I didn't have a truck or stonemasonry tools per se. And um, I had never built a stone arch before, and I didn't own any stone. So I began to ask around, and I was gifted a whole pile of thrown out marble that was in a, a heap in what is now the Shaw's parking lot in Waterbury. And I went to that parking lot every day for a whole summer and played with that heap of stone and my kids ran wild through that area. And I taught myself how to build an arch. And since then, um, I've been on a mission to build arches and I work on them all over the world, wherever I can and study arch technology and bridges and vaults and cross vaults and groin vaults and all the things that I can imagine that is an arch. Um, and right now I've been focused on building pizza ovens, which are domes with arches on the side of them. So um, it's been a very cool experience to, to travel and to, to travel the path of what stonemasonry is and the historical significance of it, and then bring that back to what is art and how does art and trade intersect and where do they diverge? And that's right in, in that moment is where my niche is. And so many artists don't have the gift of being able or don't have the opportunity to be able to make a business. It's really hard to be an artist to make a business, but you're, you're, you're creating um, works of art that are actually usable and not just arches, but circles. I mean, it's, so I wanted to ask you, where, where does your creative energy flow from? Do you vision your work before you begin creating it or while you are creating it? What is your creative process? So that's a very interesting question because I know a lot of artists have sketchbooks and they create a whole series of designs that they intend to build one day or um, projects, they jot down notes in, in some kind of sketch form. Um, I find that I am directly inspired by projects. So I don't have goal projects. I don't have visionary um, long-term um, things that I'm imagining and planning for. I am specifically inspired by locations and the client needs and the environment in that space. So um, I am often, I have this opportunity and this amazing culture where someone will see the body of my work and say, we want you to come and build us something. We don't know what it is yet. So I arrive and do a site interview and I'm interviewing the landscape, the people that live there and what is the culture of that space. And um, by, the, by that, I mean, are there animals? Are there children? Is there water? What is the climate like? And then I take all of those things and I juxtapose that with what do I want to bring to the space? And what is the history? What is my recent building history? And how do I make this thing new and inspiring for me to build? And then that all comes together. And that whole package then compares to what is the available material and what is the available budget. And in the budget, there's two components, time and money. And then all of that, all of that has to coordinate to create what installation happens for those folks at that place. And you work, you work with drywall. I mean, you don't, you don't use mortar in your work, do you? You know, I don't typically use mortar. However, I do use mortar. Um, it, is, it is required in some locations. I was just sent back to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to restore a structure that I had built there that was a dry stone wall sculpture. And it was built, it was built in such a way that moose and elk and deer would be able to scrub on it without destroying an arch or some overhead structure that would then require me to come back out and repair it. I, I built a series of walls that had created enclosure and privacy without having a big arch. So there were two windows that if you were a child and you looked through both windows, you could see the Grand Tetons right there. It just lined up and it was specifically for kids. What I did not anticipate was that someone would come along and steal the entire top of the wall. So I got sent back there to repair the wall and I put a new top on it 
and that was mortared down yeah. so that it, it wouldn't be able to be stolen or manhandled or abused. And um, likewise on college campuses, sometimes college students get a little frisky and um, can do some mischief. I'm sure they don't mean it, but it just accidentally happens. Um, anyway, and, and college campuses where things are likely to be climbed, um, most of the stone above three feet high and the stone in the arches is all mortared in. That's just for liability and security. For security. Well, most 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 of your most of your work is done done dry. It's amazing. Now you are a little woman. I am little. You are a little woman, but you are a huge woman, uh, with a tremendous amount of strength and power. Uh, you also, I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about your strength because you lift rocks that are, you know, 60, 70 pounds. And also, I understand that you do not have any fingerprints anymore. Could you talk a little bit about your strength? Sure. And fingerprints. <laughs> well, um, according to OSHA standards, which is the work site safety, women are only supposed to lift 40 pounds and otherwise have mechanical or other assistance to lift an object. Um, personally, I can lift over 200 pounds. <laughs> and um, doing that repeatedly builds a certain kind of muscle structure. And I have, I have been working with my body since I was 16. So it's, it's not uncommon for me to lift five tons of stone in a day. So just repetitive motion over time has given me a very strong, and um, it, the fact that I'm short has offered me so much advantage. I don't strain my muscles because my, my trunk is so short. And I'm already close to the ground, so I don't have to lean too far to get to it. So. Um, that's, those are advantages. Being small is an advantage uh, in terms of lifting and working mostly close to the ground. However, um, getting to the higher spaces and the taller and the, all that, um, there's any number of ladders and scaffolds and all kinds of things to climb up and get to. As far as not having fingerprints, um, they do wear off. I'm looking at my hands now. Um, the fingerprints wear off, the calluses wear in and off, and um, they they grow back. It's a constant state of change and development and um, bank robbing. <laughs> That's so wild, Thea. That's so wild. Well, listen, you have worked all over the world. Uh -huh. And, and you know, I'm just a huge fan. So I'm just going to tell you, I think you've reached rock star status. No pun intended, right? Uh -huh. Um, so I would love to try to share your website. I'm going to try to do this with our viewers and look at some of the work which you can comment comment on. Would that be okay with you? Certainly. Thank you. All right. Let me try to do this. If it, if it doesn't work, I don't want to screw things up here. Um, all right. There we are. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so your, your, your website... Um, uh, is myearthwork.com, right? It is. It is. So folks, look at it. I, I, to my viewers, uh, I want you to go visit Thea Alvin's website, myearthworks.com. There's no and, S on it. It's just no, okay, myearthwork.com um, and check out her website. But here's your gallery. So I just want to give an idea of, of, of what you do. Uh, so so why don't we why don't we just start with a couple of these and just talk about them? I mean, sure. look look at um, and I and I hope I'm doing this this uh, giving it giving it the breadth of of that it, that it deserves here at myearthworknos.com. So Thea, talk a little bit about um, the structures that you create that have these almost like circles that go uh, that create this three dimensional depth. The, uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, what you're seeing here in this in this particular image is the helix. And this helix is in my front yard right now on the edge of Route 100. And it is three arches in a series with a corkscrewing wall around it. So it, it looks like it's a strand of DNA when you're seeing it. Um, the thing about arches, which is super cool, is that they are on a single plane. They, if you can imagine a straight line, the arch spans between one end and the other end of that straight line. Um, and the way that I've made this look like it's in motion is by twisting the wall that receives the arch. 
So where the right side of that arch comes down, the wall immediately turns to the left and sweeps up and becomes the arm of the second arch in the middle. And that comes down and immediately sweeps to the left and becomes the, the right side arm of the last arch. So the whole thing looks like and is actually in a, in a twist. And you say gravity secured. There's no mortar there. there. That's all. There's no mortar there. So how do you get that last stone? I mean, how do you, will you, will you have an arch, you have a form. Yes. You use, right. And then you build it over the form and that, and that's something our viewers need to understand because when you look at it, you just, you don't, you don't know that. And it, to right. me, it's almost like it's magic. Um, all right. I tell people like, it's, it's a yoga trick. It's a we, yoga trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're about, you're a very Zen human being here. Um, so I wanted to go to, um, let's see, I wanted to talk about this. Um, oh, yeah. So beautiful. And uh, can you talk a little bit about this sculpture? This Sure. Yes. Um, this is, this is a moon gate that's out at Mandala Gardens in Marion, Illinois. And uh, this demonstrates a kind of element of artwork that I find fascinating and um, is something that I'm really keen to explore more of. And it's, it's not the work itself, but it's how uh, reflection and movement and light and wind and water all can affect what the piece of work looks like throughout the year. So here you see a moon gate in a reflecting pool and the whole thing becomes then a new image. You have all of the light and color and combinations of the environment around it. So part of, part of imagining in advance when you come to the situation is to see it in all of those opportunities. And, um, and then in looking for new, new settings uh, to put work, if there isn't a pond, I'm always looking to, to get to build one for somebody, um, but also to find ways to, uh, to imagine the piece of work in a setting that involves sunlight and shadow and weather and make sure that when I'm working through the process of what it will look like, the design process, that all of those things are taken into consideration and that they become part of what I'm able to share with the client and with their environment. Um, one of the things that is uh, really important to know about when a sculpture of this size happens in your space is that it's going to be incredibly messy for quite a while while we're building. I make a huge mud hole. I think mud is the number one component of stonework. It's just, it's going to rain when I'm working. It's a rule. And uh, we make a terrible mess and then uh, put it all back together after. And it takes a while for the land to heal and for a setting like this image to, to really fully come into itself. So watching these works age is, is really a beautiful thing because you don't have, um, you know, you won't have fresh grass to begin with. And I am lucky to have uh, portraits of this particular moon gate sent to me fairly frequently. There's a, a blue heron that hangs out there quite yeah. often stunningly beautiful Thanks. um now this 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 um so stop me i mean this was a project that you did in is it, it, it did you do this in italy is that pro uh those are what you're seeing there is a chapel inside and outside which is in vermont it's a private residence and then um the uh moon gate there is a clock that's in wisconsin it's a solstice clock on the shortest day of the year, the sun will come up and cruise through that circular window and hit the standing stone. Um, there are three standing stones in the back. It hits the center one in the middle point with a, a beam of light at dawn. So, so, the so Thea, in in you know five hundred, you know in five hundred years, a thousand years, if our species can survive, or regardless, people will look at this and say, "How did they? How did they build this?" Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's I love that. Beautiful. I, I think it's fabulous to have um, to build deep time structures and to have to offer the question like, what were they thinking in into the future? Because I often ask that as I'm working on restorative things. 
Now, as you're going over each of these pictures, it should open a link um, for your viewers to, to see some of the, the builds of each one of those things. There's I'll a whole, click on it. it should, if the maintenance of my website is limited. Because well, well of, let's talk about this because you also <laughs> use water in your, in, yes. this was done in Boulder, Colorado, right? Yeah. And yeah. you use, you, 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 not only, I mean, you're, I'm very emotional here about this. It's so <laughs> extraordinary. You you take all the elements of nature and you pull them together in these incredibly gorgeous, beautiful works of art. And so here is a beautiful waterfall that you've created. Talk a little bit about that. So this waterfall was a problem. And the problem was the solution, which is what I so love about on-site design. Um, the woman that owned this property, her name is Tat, and she bought three lots together in Boulder, Colorado. And there was an old house on the lots. And in order to build her new house, they took down the old house. And when they did, they discovered that there was a spring in the basement that they had then to do something with all this water. Now, normally a spring would be a very terrible thing to have in your house. Um, and it, but in Boulder, they're in the desert. And so now suddenly she had this opportunity. She had water rights. But where do you put this much water? And you, how do you use this much water? So that was the problem. And the solution became a 10,000 gallon cistern that I had the opportunity to build with the build team there. There was a, a landscape architect named Marco Lamb and the builder Isaac Savitz of Silver Lining Builders. The, those two men and Tat and the um, landscape, uh, the, she sort of did the botany, the design and implantation of the, the things. We used this water to create a high walled garden for Tat and her property. The, the point that the waterfall comes from is more than six feet off the ground. And it's over a series of caves that on top of which are planted gardens for people to eat from. On the inside, it's a three-sided high wall garden. On the inside are planted plants for the people that live in the house. On the outside are planted plants for people to eat from who happen to walk by. And there are signs to that effect. And it's all irrigated from the water that's coming out of this cistern. And you can see in the photo, there's that sort of diagonal line. That's representing um, a sort of a handrail for a staircase that goes down to the inside of that cistern. So if you were an animal or a person who wanted to swim or who fell in, you could walk up the staircase and then pass under the waterfall stone and out through the cave system and, and get out without any damage or danger. That's so. It became a neighborhood hub for all the kids to play and jump in and um, an entire ecosystem for all of the animals who don't have surface water in Boulder, Colorado to come and drink from and use. Um, Thea, you create experiences. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing our screen because I wanna get back to you. And um, and uh, I, I, have, I have, we're coming down sort of to, I could talk to you for an afternoon, but, I, you you believe that rocks are alive? I think I read that. I do, and, and I and I I I want to hear a little bit more about that. Well, I think that rocks have personalities, and I think that they can store a lot of energy of experiences that they have. And sometimes rocks want to do what you ask them to do, and sometimes they don't. And I try and listen um, to them because I use them all the time, and I have a lot of respect for the natural environment. We live together with the things that are outside. And so to force them to our will or to force them to do something that they don't want to do, I think is, you know, we are not the top species that are here. We just happen to be the ones that are communicating about it. So, you know, the rocks have outlived every other thing that's here and here they still are. And for our measly little time, we can't really make them do stuff. So, and you're loving them. I do love them. loving them. And it just shows in your work. It's work of love. Um, so I have a friend in my hometown um, 
whose wife passed away and you came up to his land and with his friend, she built an amazingly beautiful stone sculpture and bench where her ashes are laid. Rocks are markers of life and death. Wouldn't you agree? They are. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And also I wanted you to talk a little bit about your, you teach it yes tomorrow. And I folks, do. And folks can study under you. They can. Yes. And um, once you are my student, you're always stuck with me. So I have this love affair with all of my students where they send me letters and their pictures of the things that they're working on and they get advice and support and um, challenges to get them on the right track if they've come off the rail. So I, 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 go ahead, finish up. Okay. Uh, it's just, it, I want this thing to not be a secret. I want stone to be something shared and loved. And it used to be a hierarchical system where only masters could do certain things. And in my teaching process and in my life process, I'm the first one who is the willing worker. I'm the first one to not expect someone else to do the mundane tasks. And I, I want that to be part of the process of how I teach and how I live. And so people, people coming to learn from me learn the hardest thing to do first. They learn the secret that was the prime secret, how to arch. That's the first thing we do on the first day is learn to arch. And then after that, everything is just mechanics. Well, I want to tell you that when I was 22 years old, we built our stone house and I, I went to Starks for every day to Mayla Norris's farm with my son on my back, who was two years old. And my job was to haul the 36 truckloads of stone from Starksboro back <laughs> to the house. So I'm not that strong anymore, but I, um, I really can relate to all you. And I think I'm going to sign up for your course. I, okay. would, love to study, I would love to study with you. Um, so I'm, we're coming to the end of, end of my show. And um, yeah, I also want to mention to my, my viewers that you do barter for your work. Do you still do that? Do you still barter? From time to time. I also have to support myself. So yes, you I do. do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you do. Um, and so I want to, what, what is your rock solid advice, Thea, for our species as we deal with all the issues facing our futures? Well, when you put it that way, my rock solid advice would be to let you know that nothing is set in stone. And we always have the opportunity to change and we're completely fluid and we, it's never, never too late. And we got it. We are here. We need to make it count. I also want to ask you before I, um, I, I say farewell to you. Goodbye for, for now, just for now. What did you do with the skunk that you caught in your have a oh. <laughs> 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 I, you are enjoying my bedroom right now, and it's really great that you don't have the capacity to smell through the internet. <laughs> but you, um, but, okay, the skunk ahead. is running free back wherever it came from, and I have essence of skunk for the day. Well, it, it and for you, I'm sure you'll, you know, you'll be fine with that. Oh, you are a marvel. You are truly a Mother Earth, and I do encourage my Earth work dot com for my viewers to visit your website and um thea i'm i am just um delighted to spend time with you and to have you on my show and i hope to see you in person someday and give you a hug and i you may see me at your yes tomorrow class and awesome. until then but until then i want to wish you well hang on when i hang up here because i'd like to say goodbye to you personally and to my viewers i want to thank you for being uh, part of our show today with Thea Alvin, and I will see you again soon. So have a wonderful day and be well.